All right, everyone, it's my pleasure today to show you Vimy Ridge virtually. It's one of the most iconic sites on the Western Front, even today, uh, more than a century after the battle had ended. And here we're starting off with a bit of a taste of why this site is so iconic. This is the Canadian National Vimy Memorial, which includes the monument that you see, but also a massive memorial park, which, contrary to popular belief, is legally French territory, but it's administered by Canada. And in April 1917, it was the scene of some of the fiercest fighting on the Western Front and a pretty important Canadian and British, we shouldn't forget that, victory in 1917. And its importance even goes beyond the battle itself into the realm of identity and historical memory. And we're going to talk a bit about that on the tour today as well. And we can see here with this drone footage why the ridge had its importance, why the battle took place there, because it's looking out, it's the high ground, looking out over the plains, the Douai Plains. It is Canada's most famous battle of the war, but there is more to the story and we'll get into it. But before we go back to 1917, I have a personal connection to Vimy that I just wanted to share with you here. I was there recently talking to some Canadian students. You can see the picture on the left from the Vimy Foundation, an organization that helps students to go and learn about the history of the Great War and Canada. And then on the right-hand side, and here, folks, we are, this is a bit of a historical picture, actually. I was a student tour guide at Vimy Ridge quite a long time ago, and I had the honor and the chance to meet some of the last veterans of the Great War. Um, so those two pictures are 20-ish years apart, but let's not dwell on that, and let's dive into the history and into the Western Front. And here we see, with the help of our satellite map, the front line of the Western Front in the First World War, that blue line running from Switzerland in the south to the English Channel in the north in 1917. This is how it looked at the beginning of 1917, of course. And as you've probably heard, uh, we're in a state in 1917 of trench warfare. So there is a sort of a deadlock, but it's not a static deadlock. That's important for us to understand the tactics that are being used by both sides, the weapons that are being used for both sides, they change, they evolve, they try new things. But more or less, that deadlock still remains. And that's the situation facing both armies in the spring of 1917, when the British and French agree to make a huge offensive, to make a big joint attack in the spring. And we're gonna zoom in a little bit to the most important part of that Allied Spring Offensive, which is not Vimy Ridge, but this region of France called the Champagne region. This is the main French offensive, going to be trying to break through the German lines larger than the British and Canadian offensive in the north. Now, the French commander, Robert Nivelle, he promises a breakthrough in 48 hours by guys like these, typical French infantrymen that you see here, starting on April 16th. But that offensive fails, and part of the French army mutinies, although that is not known in early April. Neither the failure of the coming French offensive on April 16th or the mutiny, these things are not known yet in the first days of April when the British and Canadian offensive begins, and that starts first. So the, the diversion, basically, is what the British and Canadians are doing in the north near the town of Arras. That's why they start before. In, on April 9th, it's Easter Monday, by the way, the Arras Offensive, as the British call it, begins. The Germans call it the Osterschlacht by Arras because it starts on Easter. And that's what we're looking at here, the town of Arras. This is the British sector of the attack. We're going to add in a historic map here so that we can get a good sense of what things looked like at the time. The objective of this British diversion is to distract the German reserves draw them away from the main French attack that's coming the week after. Again, we don't know that that French attack is eventually going to fail. Uh, the British are going to advance on 20 kilometer front with 14 divisions. And to give you an idea of the proportions, that's less than half the size of the French offensive in Champagne. And so we can see here on our historic map overlay, the red line is essentially the front line in this sector where the British and Canadians are starting from. And we can see that Vimy is one of the key 
features. Vimy Ridge is one of the key features that's going to be taken. So we'll slide up to the northern sector of the British and Canadian attack. And now we're looking at the Canadian sector primarily, right? So it's an eight kilometer long sector that runs along the base of the ridge on the where the red line is. And what I like about this map, especially is you can see some of those contour lines. So all the little lines that make the kind of oddly shaped circles, if you will, that's high ground, right? Where you see the words Vimy Ridge kind of faintly. Uh, that's the high ground that the Canadians are going to try to take um, at the Battle of Vimy Ridge. We can also see the four colored rectangles. Those are the four Canadian divisions of the Canadian Corps, first to fourth, going from the top, the green one, to the bottom, the red one. And then there's a bit of maybe an unusual icon for some of you, the circular icon on the left, the red one. And that is the Canadian flag that was used at the time. And we'll take a closer look here. Here it is called the Red Ensign. And this was Canada's flag until 1965 when the Maple Leaf came around. So I thought it was important to point out that this is the flag that Canadians are fighting under in 1917. Now, why was the ridge so important? I think I've kind of given it away. I've alluded to it already, being the high ground, looking out over the plain. But uh, we spin around here a little bit. We're going to get a closer look. You can see the outlines of the trenches. We've overlaid the trench lines uh, onto the ridge as they existed on April 9th, based on maps from the Canadian Corps. Now, you might be wondering, OK, the trench lines are, I think, fairly clear here. But you might be wondering what those kind of wagon wheel uh, shaped icons are that one of them's right next to my face right here. Those are massive craters. And we're going to talk about them and how they came to exist a little bit later. But first, let's get a drone's eye view so that we can kind of understand this landscape a little bit better. So here's the ridge, more or less today in modern times, as it looks. And we are looking, the sheep are there, by the way, to mow the grass because it's in the red zone. So there are still munitions in the ground, which could be dangerous if you're using a, a modern lawnmower with a metal blade. But we're getting a sense here of the geography, right? So we're looking from west to east. We're looking in the directions the Canadians are going to be advancing towards the monument. So there's this very gradual slope that we are going up. It doesn't look like much. It doesn't really feel like much when you're there on the ground. But then all of a sudden, when you get closer and closer, you can see those little mini mountains on the horizon there to the left of the monument. Those are far in the distance. And so this gradual slope leads to the top of the ridge, which dominates the entire area. And that means that this was an important objective even before 1917. The Germans take it in 1914. And then the French and Moroccan troops who are here before the Canadians in 1914 and 15, they actually reached the crest of the ridge just to the left of the monument in 1915 in May, but then they're pushed back by the Germans to the base of the ridge. And there's still a memorial on the ridge today, a small Moroccan memorial, and you can see it here, uh, to commemorate the Moroccan division that made the furthest French advance. Now, those French troops are then replaced by the British in early 1916. And contrary to some Canadian legends, they don't try to take the whole ridge. As we zoom back out here to get our overview, the British kind of hold the line, do some trench raiding, some mine explosions take place, but they don't try to take the whole ridge. When the Canadians arrive in late 1916, these are the front lines. So you can see where the blue on the left meets the red trenches on the right. That's the front line. And that's kind of the starting point for the Canadians. So the Canadians on the left side of our screen again, and they're going to be advancing up the gentle, gradual slope and then reach the top of the ridge eventually. So let's take a look at this from the German point of view as we kind of twist down here with our satellite. So if we're sitting here now, we're looking in the exact opposite direction, right? That's a Canadian division, that grayish rectangle over there. And we're looking at it from the German point of view, and we can see the plane below. Even though it's such a gradual rise, when we look out to the west, we, the Germans now, can see all of that. 
Now here we can see from a bit of a more of a top-down view some of the reconstructed frontline trenches that you can see there. These were reconstructed after the war when the site became a memorial park, but this kind of labyrinth would spread all the way where you see the blue and red lines that we've added from the historic maps. And those are the German and Canadian lines, right? German red lines, Canadians blue lines, essentially. And you can see they're also quite close. So let's get a more detailed look. Here we are looking at the forward trenches around these large craters. And so no man's land is basically in this area that we're looking at just the big craters. And that's extremely close. It's only, I don't know, maybe 10 or 15 meters apart. Not all of the no man's land in general in the First World War, but also at Vimy was this narrow, was this close, could be several hundred meters. These are forward trenches. So they're not the main defenses. They're what you call sap trenches, you know, where you have observers, you might have snipers, things like that. They stick out into no man's land from the main forward lines. So why don't we slip right into those trenches actually and have a look at what they are like today in their reconstructed form. So here we are in one of the Canadian sap trenches. Of course, it doesn't look exactly like it did in April 1917. They were restored and kind of rebuilt with concrete, sort of to mimic sandbags a little bit in the interwar period. And we're here in a firing bay. You see there's a step there. You can step up and look out into no man's land if you dare. And there's a sniper plate. Now, in 1917, the sniper plate would be much better camouflaged than this, but it's, it's there to give us a flavor of trench warfare. And of course, there would be many lines of trenches on both sides, not just these very advanced ones. And in this particular part of no man's land, there is a special feature, let's say, that we've already uh, talked about a little bit, these massive craters in no man's land. So one of the features of the type of warfare as we're looking out here on some of those craters as they, as they appear today, those giant craters, while the British and Canadians are holding the line here before the big battle at Bimmy Ridge is mine warfare. Now, what that means is that each side tries to kind of break the deadlock and get local advantages in, the, in this trench warfare by digging tunnels underneath the enemy trench lines, hollowing out a big, a big chamber, filling it with explosives, and kind of laying that charge and then blowing it up. And both sides are then kind of in this game of cat and mouse where they're trying to detect where the other side is tunneling. Maybe they can create a small explosion to collapse the enemy tunnels. And this sort of back and forth is happening for months before the big battle of Vimy Ridge, let's say. And so by April 17, there are dozens of these massive craters along the ridge. And in some sectors, the craters are no man's land. That's how close we are. Like the case in this sector here. Of course, as I say, normally no man's land would be somewhat wider than this. Now today, the craters with time, they become rounded, they become shallower, they're not quite as deep as they were at that time. But we have a historic photo here where we can see what one of these craters would look like closer to the time. And you can see the scale here. You can see the size. You can also get a sense because, you know, look at how light the soil is, right? It's a very chalky soil, which is good for digging. And it's one of the reasons why they could dig so many tunnels in this area. So now we have a bit of an idea of the battlefield. Let's take a moment to talk about who is doing the fighting. So here we have one of the most iconic photographs of Canadian troops in the First World War in the area around Vimy Ridge. Uh, now the Canadian Corps is under the command of a Brit at this period in time, Julian Bing. They have four infantry divisions, about 19,000 men in each Canadian division. That's quite a lot. Those are large, extra large divisions. And one of the special things about the Battle of Vimy Ridge is that it's the first time that all four Canadian divisions are going to be fighting alongside each other at the same time. Now, we can't forget about the British. They are a critical element to this battle as well, even if it has more symbolic importance later after the war to Canadians. There are British divisions on either flank. There's a British 13th Brigade, Infantry Brigade, that is attached to the Canadian 2nd Division. And much of the artillery that is involved in the battle is British and not Canadian. So we can't forget about that. In all, the Canadian Corps has about 120,000 men ready for the attack. 
But we also don't want to forget about the Germans. So who are they? Here we see a few Germans from around this period in the war. The German Sixth Army is responsible for defending this sector under General Ludwig von Falkenhausen. Uh, in the Vimy Ridge sector, they have two Bavarian divisions and one Prussian division. And then they also have another Bavarian division in close reserve. So it sounds like four divisions against four, right? But German divisions are much smaller, only about 10,000 men per division. So that makes a huge difference. They have the 79th Reserve Division. That's the Prussian one, which is on Hill 145. We're going to talk a lot about Hill 145. And that's the high point on the ridge where the monument now sits. These divisions, though, have been weakened by uh, the shelling that has been going on in the lead up to the battle. So it's hard to say exactly, but the estimates of the German numbers defending the ridge are between 30 and 45,000 men. So they are quite outnumbered, let's say. Now here we're gonna go back to our map for a moment so we can start to get a sense of how this offensive is gonna play out, what it's gonna look like. We can see the German divisions on the right-hand side of the screen. So the black and white circle is the Prussian division. The blue and white circle is a Bavarian one. And then we have a couple of other Bavarian divisions uh, as well. One is in the far, on, on the very top of the screen near the village of Givenchy. And on the left, we have those colored rectangles indicating the Canadian divisions. All right. So how do the Canadians and British plan to take this ridge? It's not going to be an easy job, right? The Germans have an advantage. They're on the high ground. At this point in the war, the most effective tool that the Allies have <clears throat> to try to launch these kind of attacks is for a set piece, methodical attack that is timed. So you advance to certain objectives. And that's kind of what sometimes has been called the bite and hold technique. So you can plan well and make a limited advance, let's say. And that's the plan here. They do some uh, innovative things, like they issue more maps to the lower ranks, for example. But one of the key things is having these planned objectives. And they come in the form of lines. So the first objective is the black line. And it's supposed to be taken very, very early in the morning. The assault is to start at about 5.30 or so. Once it is secure, the Canadian troops are supposed to move on to the red line and capture that which includes where the monument stands today, Hill 145, which we can see there towards the top of your screen. Then the next two phases are a bit more limited to the Southern sector. There's the blue line and the brown line. And that is the kind of shallower, not so high part of the ridge and not all the divisions would be involved in taking the blue and brown lines, just the southerly ones, all right? Now, the Northern sector is much shallower. It's only about a thousand meters deep. That's, that's what the Canadians want to do, advance a thousand meters, which in the conditions of 1917, folks, is not easy, right? And there are two key pieces of high ground. I mentioned Hill 145, but there's also another important hill that's almost as high, just off the northern tip of the ridge called the Pimple. Now, part of this plan to capture the ridge and the Pimple and Hill 145 is to advance in secrecy and safety. Because if you're just advancing through the normal trenches that we see here in blue, you are, you're kind of vulnerable to enemy artillery fire, fire. So that means that the Canadians as much as possible are gonna to try to go underground. And that's why we're gonna see here these 13 perpendicular blue lines that have just appeared, perpendicular to the front line that is. These are tunnels but they're not the same as the mining tunnels. They are transportation tunnels, basically, called subways. And they're up to 1,700 meters long. And the most well-known is the Grange subway. And we're gonna see that a little bit later. Uh, but yeah, these subways allow the Canadian troops to move underground to the frontline trenches in a bit of secrecy and safety. Now, another key part of the attack as we kind of take a bird's eye view from the West here, looking over Canadian shoulders towards the Germans, is the artillery. Artillery is the most important weapon in the First World War. And we can see quite a few icons have just appeared on your screen. It's not an exhaustive 
let's say, display of Canadian and British artillery positions. But we wanted to give you a sense of where, especially the field artillery is located. So the, the smaller artillery that's going to be uh, playing its part in supporting the advance. Now, artillery can be used in different ways, right? It's not a one trick pony, so to speak. As we see some footage here of um, Canadian or British guns firing uh, near the front, we see some heavier guns here as well, um, some howitzers and so forth. But basically, you can support the infantry as they advance, and you can also, before the battle, try to take out the enemy artillery. And that is called counter battery fire. And it was quite successful before the battle begins at Vimy Ridge. About 80% of the German batteries are suppressed using some innovative techniques that Canadians helped or led the way in, depending on who you ask, develop, like flash spotting. So you can look at night and see where there are, there's a flash visible when a German gun fires. You can try to locate it that way. Or sound locating, where you can listen to the sounds of the guns using some special instruments and kind of triangulate based on the sound of the German guns, where they are. And the Germans call the week leading up to the actual attack, the week of suffering, the Leidenswoche, because they're being pounded by British and Canadian artillery. So that's the attack plan. But what about the defense plan? The, the Germans are not just kind of sitting around. They'd been preparing for uh, the offensive because they kind of knew it was coming. You can't hide this thing. First thing that helps the Germans defend, of course, is trenches. This is the name of the game in 1917. Uh, it's basic to defend. You can see some here in this archival aerial pick uh, from the Canadian archives. Normally, what the Germans want to do is a defense in depth. So you have multiple lines of trenches, and you don't expect to hold the first line of trenches. You plan on keeping some reserves, and then exhaust the enemy as they capture a few lines of trenches, and then they're not gonna get very far, right? But the ridge is very narrow, especially in the north. It's only about a kilometer wide. And so this kind of makes it harder for the Germans to use their defense in depth technique. And they had trouble implementing this new idea of defense in depth because they had only developed it the previous fall after the Battle of the Somme. Now here we see a German map of the trenches, right? This is a, this is what the Germans called the Fischer sector of their defense. You can see that word right there, Fischer on the bottom right on your screen. That is the sector that includes the monument today. Um, now you can see here as well that the Germans have three positions, each consisting of several lines of trenches. What we're seeing here is part of the front position and there's an intermediate position as well called the Zwischenstellung. And then all the way on the right-hand side, you can see it kind of looks like 11 Stellung, that, uh, that far right-hand blue line, but it's actually Zweite Stellung, second position. So here's a little cross-section of the German defenses. And at the bottom of the screen in the middle is Hill 145, where that monument is sounding. I like looking at the German sources because it's quite interesting to see how they've named their own trenches, right? There's the Kaiserweg or the Prince Heinrich Weg. Makes for an interesting contrast to the more familiar English trench names uh, that, we, that we more often hear. So let's look at this exact area on the German map on our satellite map today. And we can compare a little bit, right? So here it is. You can see the monument in Hill 145. And you can see the Kaiserweg and the Prince Heinrich Weg and also the second position running along on the right-hand side. So just as the Canadian map shows us these red lines, the German map um, showed them as well. And if you visit the Memorial Park today, which I of course recommend that you do, you will still be able to see some remnants of these trenches that have not completely disappeared, as well as of course, lots of shell holes uh, that you can still see in addition to those craters that we saw. All right, let's go back to our map and we'll start to follow the attack now as it begins on April 9th, Easter Monday, 1917. So let's talk about phase one, okay? So this is getting to the first objectives. 5.30 in the morning, there's a snowstorm and the wind is blowing 
into the Canadians' faces, so from east to west, from right to left on your screen against the Canadian advance, which is coming from left to right. Um, at first, the progress is pretty good, and the Canadian infantry is mostly able to overrun the German positions. And the black line is reached, and the red line is then reached mostly by about 6.30 in the morning. So this goes quite quickly. The exception is in the area of attack of the first, uh, sorry, the fourth um, Canadian division, the green division, the rectangle there. So let's dive down and we'll take a look to see what's happening as the troops are advancing. And we're gonna dive down into the third division sector for the moment. And this particular little part of the front line that we see was held by a very famous Canadian um, infantry regiment called the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry, the PPCLI for short. And they are using the Grange subway that I talked about. And so uh, let's go right into the Grange subway underground and have a look. So here we are in the Grange subway. We are about 10 meters beneath the surface at Vimy Ridge. And this particular subway is about 800 meters long. And you can see this chalky light soil that I mentioned when we looked at the big uh, historic crater picture. You can see what it's like here, right? This is what they're digging through. Now, this subway doesn't look exactly as it did in 1917 because it's open to visitors who come and visit the memorial site at Vimy. So it's been widened and it's been reinforced, but it still gives us a sense of what the subway was like. And it's still quite exciting, I have to say, and touching to kind of move in the footsteps of some Canadian soldiers who were moving through this area on the morning of April 9th. Now, a subway like this would have first aid stations, communication wiring running, running through it, maybe some supplies, maybe a battalion headquarters, all that kind of thing in the safety of the subway underground. And two companies of the PPCLI came through the Grange subway system on that morning of April 9th. And we can try when we're here, or when you're even better if you're ever there in person, to imagine the feelings that they must have been going through, right? The fear. When you're hearing the muffled sounds through 10 meters of earth above you, of shells exploding overhead, and you're not sure what's going to happen when you yourself come out of the subway into the sap trenches and then out into no man's land. All right, so here we are in a Canadian forward trench in one of those sap trenches. We've come out of the Grange Tunnel as the PPCLI would have done. And now we are sort of looking out over those craters into no man's land. So let's go over the top like in April, 1917. Now, thanks to the magic of our drone technology, uh, we're hovering here and now we're crossing over no man's land, crossing over those craters. And we're gonna do that, of course we would have had to use the little lip in between the craters, for example, otherwise we'd have a rough time going right through them. Now we're getting to those German frontline trenches and we're looking towards the east. You can't see it very well because of the trees, but this is that gradual slope going up towards eventually the crest of the ridge, right? So if we're in the shoes of the, of the PPCLI, we would be moving in this direction, clearing these trenches, and moving off towards the east, towards the crest. So what might this have looked like to us at the time? Here we have a really interesting picture of a similar view to what the Canadian troops would have had at the time. These are British shells exploding up ahead of us. So up that slope, it's a very bare slope at the time, right? There's not as many trees, obviously. Um, up ahead on that slope, we see those pieces of earth, kind of those fountains of earth going up. Those are, if we're in putting ourselves in the Canadians' shoes, those are our shells. Those are British shells blowing up on the German line. And this is a real picture. This was taken on April 9th. So this is the actual Battle of Vimy Ridge happening, the actual artillery explosions happening. So this image also gives us a chance to talk about another part of the artillery plan, because using artillery is a complicated science at the time, right? You can't just fire willy-nilly, of course, it has to be planned. And we've come back here to our satellite map 
and we're going to overlay this barrage map. So this is the artillery plan for the Canadian attack. You can see there are a lot more lines because it's a complicated thing. Now, the Canadians, again, to remind you here, are advancing from left to right. On your screen, you see those colored objective lines, black, red, blue, and brown. All the other lines are where the artillery shells are going to fall, right? The idea is they're using what's called a rolling barrage, which is a technique that worked quite well at Vimy Ridge. It's not the first time it was ever used. It wasn't invented by the Canadians. They, for example, took a lot of ideas from the French, but Vimy Ridge is one time where it really comes together and it's well done, even though it's quite difficult. So each one of those little thin lines is a phase in that rolling barrage. So the shells are falling, the infantry advances behind the protection of those shells, the Canadian infantry, then those shells move on. So the guns fire a little bit farther away. And the idea is that the Germans have to keep their heads down when they're being shelled. And by the time the barrage lifts and goes to the next line, the infantry, the Canadian infantry were right behind it and get into the German trenches before they can really defend them properly. That is the plan. So now our barrage map is going to leave us. But of course, the rolling barrage, it's a very useful thing, but it doesn't solve all the problems of an attack. And the fourth division is experiencing quite a few difficulties. Now, we're focusing in here on the northern sector where the 4th Canadian Division was. And here is the shallowest part of the ridge, but it's also the highest part. So it's, it's quite tricky, right? The objective here is to take Hill 145, which you see on the right-hand side of your screen. Some of the issues are about the ground. So the ground has been really churned up from previous fighting more than other areas of the attack. So it's more muddy. And it's going to prove the most difficult area for the Canadians. And in this sector, the attack really starts with a bang. And you can see here is a picture of these some mines going off on the northern edge of the ridge. There were two mines blown to help disrupt the German defensives. Supposedly, according to the caption in the archives, this is a picture of those mines going off. But there's some debate about that because it doesn't quite look like a typical mine. It looks like blowing an extra sap trench or something along those lines. So there's a bit of a historical uh, mystery, let's say, around this picture. But the idea behind the mines is to destroy the defenders in that area to allow the infantry to advance more easily. So the Canadian advance begins, and here we see some footage of the time with Canadian troops advancing. They're not under intense fire, uh, clearly. Uh, it's a bit of a, it's a medley of, of, um, of different footage here. So there, some is taken, you know, when the troops are not quite under direct fire. But in general, the 4th Division has a tough time, right? There's some confusion, right? 4th Division reports that things are going well, but that's not true. The 102nd Battalion gets to the 1st German line, but they take really heavy losses. They're from Northern British Columbia, by the way at this time. Uh, the 87th Battalion, which is from Montreal, fails and falls back. And then the 54th and 75th Battalions, they're supposed to pass through the others and continue the advance. But because the first wave of the attack doesn't go very well, they kind of get tangled up. So this is kind of the situation that's facing the Canadians in that sector of Vimy Ridge. Things don't start very well. The very Northern Brigade, north of, of the Hill 145 does a bit better, but it's still a tricky situation and there's still a lot of confusion. And one Canadian officer, Thane McDowell of the 38th Ottawa Battalion, wins a Victoria Cross in that area. And we have an excerpt of a report that he wrote just after taking some German trenches. So let's have a listen. I don't know where most of my officers and men are, but I am getting them together. The men's rifles are a mass of mud and they are cleaning them. My three runners and I came to the dugout I had selected previously as my company headquarters. We chucked a few bombs down and then came down. We explored it and sent out 75 prisoners and two officers. This is not exaggerated, as I counted them myself. 
I'm afraid a few of them got back to their own side as I caught one man shooting one of our men after he had given himself up. He did not last long, and I am afraid we could not take any back except a few who were good dodgers as the men chased them back with rifle shots. Right. So I think that this report from McDowell, who, by the way, went to school not very far from where I'm from, just a quick mention, um, I think his report shows that there's this confusion, even, even in the midst of success. Right, War is a confusing thing when you're on the ground. The conditions like mud, complications with taking prisoners under those circumstances, these are some of the things that are reflected in that little excerpt from his report. So now let's take a look at the German side of things. What's going on with the Germans when all this is happening with the Canadians uh, up in this sector? So here we're looking at the battlefield from the point of view of the 261st Reserve Regiment, part of this Prussian division defending against the Canadian 4th Division, right? Now they're being pounded by the rolling barrage and they know that the Canadian infantry is following right behind it. So what the Germans wanna do is get their machine guns into action as soon as they possibly can. And we see here a private picture from a private collection that I was lucky enough to get my hands on, um, of a German machine gun position on Vimy Ridge. Now, this is from 1915 when they're fighting the French. So it's not an exact match, but it gives you an idea of what these kind of positions might be like, although they were more developed in 1917. Machine guns are key to the defense on the ground, so much so that it's possible, it's very hard to say with 100% certainty, but it's possible that just two German machine guns, like the one you see here, were primarily responsible for stopping the attack of the entire 87th Canadian Battalion in that sector. And what this fighting is like from the German point of view, we can get an idea from a, from a report by a German officer by the name of Hagemann. So let's have a listen. Our machine guns and flanking positions had a great effect and struck down rows of Englishmen, but the German artillery barrage did no harm to the British infantry. The enemy artillery was very well placed as the attack made progress. It was always just a little forward of the British infantry. This and the immediate heavy British rifle and machine gun fire caused very heavy German casualties. So Hagemann, I think here he reminds us that both sides are paying the price. Right? The Canadians are suffering losses advancing and the Germans are suffering serious losses defending as well. So now that we've had these views from the trenches, I think it's time for us to zoom back out a little bit and take stock of what's going on with the battle. Now we're going to look a bit at the southern sector. We looked at the north before and now we'll look at the south and we'll take stock, um, let's say, in the, mid, the middle of the morning. So you have these blue and brown lines, the kind of extra lines, objective lines in the south. They are reached all the way up on the right-hand side of your screen at the top to that village called Farbu, what you see up there. That's kind of the brown line. And we can use a bit of an aerial overlay taken at the time to give us a sense of what the landscape looked like. So let's take a closer look and kind of zoom down in there on our archival aerial overlay that we can see. And it's uh, right in the southern tip of the Canadian sector. And we can get a, a bit of an idea of the kind of moonish landscape, right? You see these craters from artillery shells everywhere. You see some very large craters that are a bit more visible in the south. Those are again, those mine explosions underground. But I want to take us back. I want to focus again on the village of Ferbu because this is an important part of the attack. It's the Canadians are supposed to make it right up to the village. And so here we are with our satellite view, looking, uh, looking out at the village of uh, Ferbu, and we can see that there's a wood right next to it, a kind of a little small forest, a little wood that we're kind of hovering above here in our satellite view. And I chose to show you the view from this satellite vantage point because we can see what it looked like 105 years ago. Let's take a look at the historic pick. There it is. So those little toothpick trees is the wood that we were just looking at from how it kind of looks today. And the ruins that you can see in the background there, that is what the village of Farbu looked like at that time. 
And the, the Germans had a nickname for one of the woods, uh, the small woods on the ridge, which was Zahnstocherwald. And that's why I referenced the toothpicks, because that's what it means, toothpick wood. Um, that's, how heavy the shelly, that's how heavy the shelling was on, on Vimy Ridge. So the southern part of the Canadian attack reaches its objectives, but they're still having trouble in the north, right? So here we are back in the north. The black line, so the second objective, is eventually taken, but there are some problems, right? Uh, getting to the red line, where the monument is standing. The 54th and 75th battalions, uh, they are from, respectively, British Columbia and Southern Ontario, Mississauga for the 75th, by the way. They are stuck, right? They're having trouble getting through the first German line to reach the red line here, to reach that objective on the crest of the ridge. So there's one more attack that's going to be tried to capture the Hill 145 on the evening of April 9th. And we're going to take a drone view this time to get a, a sense of this final attack. So you can see the pockmarked craters, remains of trenches as we approach the very crest, right, where the monument is. And the battalion, the Canadian battalion that is attacking over this ground, after the others, some of the others have not quite gotten there, is the 85th Battalion from Nova Scotia, Highlanders. And they are relatively inexperienced. The plan is not for them to lead, you know, from the front and to lead an attack. But these are the circumstances, and that's what they do. And they are able to clear most of the German positions on the crest of the ridge that are left over and Hill 145. The Germans do maintain a small toehold on the crest and a bit on the, on the slope. Um, and we have an account of a German officer, Captain Bermann, Hauptmann Bermann, who was in this area. So let's have a listen to him. Of the first three British waves, almost nothing remained. But then there was a machine gun belt stoppage which could not be cleared. Fanatic efforts, shaking, pulling, cold, achieves nothing. Having sucked up dirt and moisture for days, the belt jammed and could not be freed. Shot through the head, Gefreiter Neumann fell, as did the rest of his crew, together with a large crew manning the trench. Some brave leads rescued the machine gun and carried it to an agent's post. All right, so I think that description, what, what, what it makes me think about, I guess what sticks in my mind every time, every time I hear it, is that something like a belt stoppage in a machine gun is really the difference between life and death for both Germans and Canadians. Something as kind of absurdly simple and mechanical and random as that. So the 85th Battalion completes the capture of the ridge, basically, with a little bit of an exception. And we have a description as well from the Canadian side, from a Canadian officer of the aftermath. The bodies were in all shapes and shapelessness of sudden death, many on their backs, with hands raised and a wild look of terror on their faces from the shell or bayonet that had hurled them into eternity. So I think, you know, clearly here, uh, this is a, a difficult a difficult situation for all involved. It's even difficult to think about it when we hear that account, but we get a sense of the carnage uh, that is the Battle of, of Vimy Ridge and that is the First World War more generally. And of course, in the midst of that, what's being described here, there's still fighting going on. Once the trenches are taken, they need to be cleared and consolidated. You, you never know, there could be some Germans in a particular dugout. We see here a German strong point that's been taken. Canadians are sitting uh, in, in the trench next to that concrete uh, strong point. So they need to go through the trenches, clear them, flush the Germans, remaining Germans out of their dugouts and so on. This is of course quite stressful for both sides. And we have a German account of a Lieutenant Bitkow. Now he's badly wounded and he's in a dugout when Canadians arrive in his sector of the trench. More shouting. They are already in the trench above. Then it got quiet, very quiet, until the foreign sounding. Come out! Quick considerations shot through my dual head. What will they do? Throw grenades into the dugout. If one lands under my bed, I'm done for. Will they beat me to death with rifle butts? Better to shoot myself. But the revolver is on the table. 
and I cannot move. Then a Tommy came through the tunnel, looked cautiously around the corner with a big revolver in his hand. He searched the dead and left to bring his bodies. So here we can get a sense of the existential fear that Bitcow was feeling. Now he survived, which is why we have the account, but quite a lot of Germans in his position uh, did not. Now, once those trenches are cleared, they need to be consolidated and heavy machine guns need to be brought up like we see here in this picture. You see they're bringing up a Vickers a heavy machine gun into the remnants of a trench or a shell hole. It's hard to say given the destruction. They also need to evacuate wounded, which of course is no easy task in those conditions. Um, Walter Bapti was a medical officer with the 102nd Canadian Battalion involved in treating the wounded. And he tried to describe what the medical personnel was facing. I cannot begin to describe all the variety of cases. Rifle wounds, shell wounds, but no bayonet wounds. Fractures of all parts, from depressed fractures of the skull to the bones of the foot. It was just a bloody jumble. It is impossible for you to imagine how plastered they were with muck and corruption. So you can see here in this picture, I like this picture, by the way, especially when we zoom in a little bit, because you can see the strain on the men's faces, including the two German prisoners who are helping that wounded Canadian there uh, on the left-hand side. And I think that passage brings home the physical realities, the physical consequences of a battle like this one, which of course is still going on. It's not a one-day battle. As we go back to our map here, our satellite map, by the end of April 9th, nearly all the ridges in Canadian hands. There were some German counterattacks, but they were weak on the night of uh, the 9th to the 10th. And German commanders have come in for some criticism because they held their reserves too far back. And when the battle comes, they're not able to move those reserves up quickly enough through the chaos and through the British and Canadian shelling to make a difference and to recapture the lost ground. From April 10th to 12th, the last bits of the crest and the eastern slope of the ridge are taken by the Canadians. And the pimple is taken, this other hill, this other feature, which is uh, on the left-hand side of your screen. You can see it labeled there. Because German positions on the pimple, if, you, if the Canadians weren't going to take them, the Germans could then enfilade across that little valley between the pimple and the start of the ridge. So we can see if we overlay again here some historic images, it helps to give us a sense of the state of the ground on this part of the ridge and also the kind of honeycomb labyrinth of German trenches. Now, I just kind of glossed over those last three days of the battle, right? The April 10th to 12th, capturing the, the rest of the crest, capturing the pimple, it wasn't as easy as it sounds, right? If you're on the ground, you're involved in this fighting, it's not a sideshow. And we have an account from a Canadian soldier, Private Neil McLeod, who was attacking the pimple as a part of a rifle grenade team. We hadn't gone three or four steps when the little fellow who loaded the rifle grenade for me had his head blown off. I was looking right at him and all of a sudden his head just vanished. I had bits of his brain splattered all over my tunic. So folks, I don't think I need to add much uh, to that. It speaks for itself, whether the battle is big and famous or small and not so famous, uh, the realities of war are just as cruel. And McLeod, in fact, was later killed in 1918. So let's go back and have a look at the top of the ridge now. The Germans retreat as we kind of settle in onto the top part of the ridge, we are looking out over the plain towards the east. So the Germans are retreating away from us into that flat plain. And we are looking at from our, from the Canadian point of view now, who have control of the ridge, looking out over that Douai plain. And we can see the importance of the position today. And it was also clear back then in historic footage, like this bit of film that we have taken from approximately this position, you can see the light soil again, it's all been chewed up. It's all that chalky soil. And we're looking out over the Douai Plain and the village of Vimy, which is what the ridge is named after, right? 
But if we kind of take a step back here and assess the Arras offensive as a whole did not distract the German reserves as it was supposed to. Right? So tactically, capturing Vimy Ridge and some of the ground that the British captured to the south of Vimy Ridge as well, it's important. It improves the, the local situation of the Allies, and it's a sign of things to come. But strategically, it's not a game changer. The Germans retreat to other defensive lines several kilometers back. So strategically, it doesn't change the course of the war, but it's still quite costly. Now, the numbers on the German side, as we see here, some German prisoners and walking wounded are tough to estimate, but um, there are about 7,000 losses for just two of the three German divisions that were directly involved. And there were about 4,000 prisoners like the ones that you saw in that picture. Canadian numbers are more exact. There are about 10,000 losses overall, killed and wounded, of which 3,600 were killed. Not to mention, of course, the many thousands of French and British and Germans who died on the ridge earlier in the previous fighting. We shouldn't forget about that. That is, folks, the human cost of Vimy Ridge. And it's one of the reasons why it led the ridge to become an important site. But of course, as Canadians in particular will know, the site and the battle also have a, a national importance in our national memory. So let's go back to the memorial for a moment to talk about some of this symbolic importance, maybe even some of this mythic importance of the Battle of Vimy Ridge. So here we are on the monument today, looking out over the plain. This figure, this statue is called Canada Bereft. So this represents Mother Canada, if you will, uh, mourning the loss of her sons in the First World War and in particular at Vimy Ridge. Now the battle was well known at the time. Uh, it got a lot of attention in newspapers. It was played up as being a Canadian battle as well. I think there was a French newspaper that said, oh, the Canadians' Easter gift to France is Vimy Ridge and so on. One of the reasons why it's an appealing battle for the news cycle, if you will, as we look at the, the pillars here representing France and Canada as part of the memorial. One of the reasons why the battle uh, kind of is high profile is because it's a clear cut and definable success. There's a ridge, everybody can understand that, right? There's a piece of high ground and it's taken. So it's a definable success. And those were often lacking during this period of trench warfare. So even though strategically at the grander level, the Arras offensive as a whole and the Nivelle French offensive in Champagne, they both kind of fail. But you have this concrete, tangible success at Vimy Ridge. So that makes it kind of appealing at the time. Now, some Canadians didn't really give the battle at Vimy Ridge that much kind of national importance at the time, but others did. And one who did was 19-year-old Percy Winthrop McClare, a Canadian soldier, who wrote a letter to his family. You have no doubt heard before this of the big advance of the Canadians and the capture of Vimy Ridge. I was in the hole of that battle, and it was hell. I got a small splinter of shrapnel through the fleshy part of my shoulder. It was very slight, and I went through it all with it. It was some battle, and I'm glad to say that I was through it, as it will be one of the biggest things in Canadian history. The battle at Vimy, by the way, was his second day with his unit, so he really had a serious baptism by fire. And he was right. Vimy has since become kind of the focus of Canadian national memory of the First World War. And part of that is because it was chosen as this site for the memorial and for this monument. It was chosen from a kind of competition. There, they, there were different considerations of other sites. Eventually, an architect called Walter Allward was his design for this monument was selected. It won the competition. The two pillars, as I mentioned, represent Canada and France. There are lots of allegorical figures carved into the limestone as well with these universal virtues of faith and justice and peace, honor, charity, truth, knowledge, and hope. 
So in Allward's mind, this is what the Allies are fighting for, and that's why they're on the why they're on the uh, monument. And then there's this spirit of sacrifice idea. So between the pillars is um, a symbolic tomb down at the front of the monument as well, which we can't see from this angle, but there's a symbolic tomb as well. The monument also commemorates individual soldiers. So it's on this flat base and all the walls are filled with chiseled names like the ones that you see here. Those names are of Canadians who died in France during the First World War. There's a separate one for those who died in Belgium and who don't have a known grave. And there are 11,285 of those, give or take a few adjustments after the war, and then some were identified. But those are the names on the memorial. And if you look right at the middle, you see a name that is P.W. McClair. And that is the McClair that we just heard from talking about how Vimy is an important Canadian battle. He wrote that letter, but then he would not live to see that later fame of the battle that he was predicting and expecting because he was killed just a few weeks after Vimy Ridge on May 5th. Now, many relatives come to Vimy Ridge after the battle in the interwar period to visit, including for the big unveiling of the memorial that we see here in 1936. Now, those airplanes are probably airbrushed into this picture for the press and so on, but this is a picture of that pilgrimage, as they called it. Many veterans came and family members came as well. And this is part of the creation of this special meaning for Vimy Ridge. Uh, it's, a, it's a focus, it's a site, it's a symbol for things that happened away from Vimy Ridge, right? Other battles, other suffering, other lost relatives kind of come together at this place of Vimy Ridge. And it has a deep meaning today for many Canadians who connect it with World War I and with this idea of Canadian national identity taking shape. Different people, of course, attach different meanings to history, doesn't necessarily mean that all Canadians agree on the role of the First World War in the development of Canadian identity, but for many, it's quite important. And on the topic of different meanings, I want to read you a quote from someone who felt, who was there and felt that Vimy Ridge was a very important place to him. So here's the quote, all right? The fierce battle over Vimy Ridge was fought to a standstill. To be able to call oneself a Vimy warrior was from then on a high honor. In the hearts of the warriors and their loved ones who lived through it all in the homeland, the memory of the days of heroic glory and deepest sorrow glows indelibly at the Battle of Vimy Ridge. That patch of earth has been sanctified by the rivers of noble blood and innumerable heroic graves. Strong stuff, right? Poetic stuff. That's a quote from after the war by a German officer who was at Vimy Ridge, Alfred Dietrich, which may come as a surprise to some of you. He also felt that Vimy was a sacred place for Germany, even though today, of course, most Germans don't feel that way. Most Germans don't know that the Battle of Vimy Ridge took place because the meaning and the memory of it are not the same in Germany as they are in Canada. It didn't get created and nurtured in that same way. And in fact, the picture we see here is the very large German cemetery close to Vimy Ridge. 44,000 are buried there from, from various battlefields. But these different ideas about national importance, I think they don't take away from the grief that individual families felt who'd lost a loved one, like this family here. This is the Turner family from the UK, and their older son was killed at Festubert, so not far from Vimy Ridge, not at the Battle of Vimy Ridge, but close to it. And this is them on Vimy Ridge in the reconstructed trenches that we have also visited today virtually on a family visit in 1928. So even though their son, their other son, you see the, the younger one here in the picture, was killed at Festubert in a British uniform, Vimy was still a site of mourning for them, generally speaking. 
So the grieving I feel is it's something we should keep in mind. It's just as painful whether it's a Canadian family, a German family, a British family, or of course, a French family, many of whom also lost relatives at Bimmy Ridge. On the whole, as we take a final kind of look in typically foggy weather at the monument, right, for, for this part of France, more than 10,000 people died on Vimy Ridge, likely in just a few days in April 1917, joining the tens of thousands of others who died on and around Vimy Ridge from previous battles. And that is what's on my mind when I visit Vimy Ridge in person or even virtually here with you today. And I hope that this tour has helped you feel a connection to Vimy Ridge and the experience of the First World War as well. And that's the thought that I wanted to end the tour with tonight. So thank you so much for joining us on the tour. And now we'll take your questions. So there we are, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you uh, enjoyed that virtual tour. Back with Jesse now. Uh, always such a passion for this subject, Jesse, and, and fascinating to be able to explore it with that different range of media as well. So I um, hope you guys joining us either for the first time or for one of our normal repeat tours have also enjoyed it as well. It's, it's, it's such a fascinating topic and a, and a great place to visit as we discuss pre-tour. We got our little glitch out of the way in the first 10 seconds of the tour. So hopefully that's the, the entire history of our YouTube problems going forward. We do now have time for uh, about a 15, 20 minute Q&A uh, with Jesse here live with us as well. So plenty to go through. Um, Jesse, just before we get into the Q&A proper, just give us a, a very quick recap about the, the reason why we're doing this tour in the way that we're doing it tonight and why it's important. Yes, well, of course, we want to bring the virtual guided tours that you do to a wide audience, so we're here live on YouTube, but also we have uh, another motive in mind, which is charity to send humanitarian aid to Ukraine, as we mentioned um, before the tour began. But um, yeah, I work with a, I volunteer with an organization here in Vienna, where I'm sitting, founded by some Ukrainians who came together at the beginning of the war called Ukraine, Y-O, Ukraine. And they send regular shipments. Now they've organized themselves. They're a fully functioning small NGO, small charity. And they send regular shipments of humanitarian aid. They specialize in medical aid as well. Although they've they shifted over the winter, of course, to generators and warm sleeping bags and other things as well as the medical aid that they've been sending. And they send this to Ukraine. They are a local organization. They're small. They're not bureaucratic. They're grassroots. So you can be sure that if you donate, and we very much, I personally very much encourage you to donate to this um, charity. I've worked with them. I know them. I know the team working there. I've worked with them before. Uh, the link is in the description below this video, ukraine.at, AT for Austria, uh, slash donate. Uh, and I would really appreciate it. And that's one of the reasons why we wanted to do this live tour and the way that we've done it is to bring that message uh, to let you folks know about this organization and what they're doing. They have sent medical devices, they've sent supplies, bandages, medicine, um, devices to allow blood transfusions to happen more easily, protective devices, medical, surgical instruments, uh, you name it, casts, wheelchairs. They've been sending this stuff to where it's needed most in Ukraine, entire ambulances, They've been buying used ambulances with donations. I help to load trucks, unload trucks. I help to fundraise and make people aware about them. And I drove one of the ambulances to Ukraine to deliver it to the humanitarian services there as well uh, back earlier in the fall. So that's my little pitch for the Ukraine charity based in Vienna. I'd really appreciate it if uh, any of you could spare any donations. <laughs> 